Sok szeretettel üdvözlök mindenkit a 20. század intézet nevében, Franco és 1956 című rendezvényünkön. Örülünk, hogy ilyen sokan eljöttek, és külön öröm, hogy ennyi fiatal is van a hallgatóság soraiban. Ma az 1956-os forradalom és szabadságharc egy olyan aspektusáról lesz szó, amely viszonylag kevéssé ismert, és általában kevés szót ejtünk róla. Mikor a forradalom nemzetközi vonatkozásairól beszélünk, akkor általában leggyakrabban a szuezi válság, az Egyesült Államok vagy az ENSZ szerepe merül fel. Mindeközben azonban érdemes azt is észben tartanunk, hogy Spanyolország egyedüliként a nyugati hatalmak közül hajlandó lett volna katonai úton támogatni a magyar szabadság ügyét. Ezen epizód egyszerre ad lehetőséget számunkra megismerni a Francisco Franco tábornok által vezetett Spanyolországot, a magyar-spanyol kapcsolatokat, valamint a hidegháborús nemzetközi rend törvényeit. Megtiszteltetés, hogy mindezekről ma Madridból érkező vendégünk, Ricardo Ruiz de la Serna, a Madridi San Pablo Egyetem modernkori egyetemes történelemmel foglalkozó tanszékének oktatója fog beszélni. Ruiz de la Serna úr munkája során a 20. századi politikai és társadalomtörténet különböző kérdéseivel foglalkozik, vendégoktatóként és kutatóként megfordult többek között Németországban, Lengyelországban és Hollandiában is. Rendszeresen jár hazánkba, és elkötelezetten dolgozik annak érdekében, hogy érthetőbbé tegye a magyar történelmet, a magyar kultúrát és a Magyarországgal kapcsolatos aktualitásokat saját hazájába. Ruiz de la Serna urat idén tavasszal a Magyar Érdemlend Lovak keresztjével tüntették ki, és lassan már a magyar nyelv sem jelent neki akadályt, hiszen szorgosan tanulja azt. Először megkérem Schmidt Máriát, a 20. század intézet főigazgatóját, az esemény ötletgazdáját, hogy mondja el köszöntőjét. Tisztelt Hölgyeim és Uraim, kedves vendégeink! A 1956-os Magyarországi Forradalom és Szabadságharc november 4-én a szovjet megszálló csapatok véres megtorlásának áldozatává esett. A szovjet vörös hadsereg és az őket támogató maroknyi kollaboráns elsöpörte ezt a fantasztikus küzdelmünket, amely reményt adott Magyarország minden egyes polgárának abban a tekintetben, hogy újra szabadok és függetlenek lehetünk. A Terrorháza Múzeum kiemelt feladatának tekinti, hogy a 20. század intézeten keresztül minél többet beszéljen erről a világ rengető eseményről, és ennek a nemzetközi vonatkozásait is bemutassa. Ennek a keretében rendezzük meg a mai előadásunkat, mert ahogy kolléganőm Baconi Dóra is említette, Franco tábornok Spanyolországja hajlandó lett volna megsegíteni a magyar szabadságharcosokat, amire Nyugat-Európa többi ö, hatalma nem lett volna hajlandó, sőt, amely törekvést az amerikai Egyesült Államok egyenesen le is állította. Fontosnak tartom, hogy ezt a gesztusát a spanyoloknak a magyar közönség jobban megismerje, és ezért örülünk annak, hogy Magyarország barátja Ricardo Ruiz de la Serna kollégám eljött hozzánk, és meghallgathatjuk azt az előadást, amiben ezeket az eseményeket ismerteti a számunkra. Nagyon köszönöm, hogy ilyen érdeklődéssel fordulnak e felé a téma felé, és én magam is nagy izgalommal várom az előadást. Köszönöm.
Köszönöm szépen főigazgató asszony szavait. Most pedig felkérem eseményünk főszereplőjét, Ricardo Ruiz de la Szernát, hogy tartsa meg előadását. Jó napot kívánok! Uh, én csak egy kicsit magyarul beszélek, akkor én angolul beszélek. I will, I will speak English because my English is more fluent than my Hungarian. My level A1 doesn't allow me to, to give a lecture in Hungarian yet. But I want to, I want to thank Professor Schmidt and Dr. Vachoni for their words. It is, a, it is a great, great honor for me to be considered a colleague by such an outstanding academic as Professor Maria Schmidt. I wish someday I could be, I could really a colleague at your level. Um, I'm very honored also to be here, ladies and gentlemen, in this city of Budapest, in the city so many times threatened, besieged, and destroyed by the enemies of freedom. And I am truly honored, lamely, to be here at this building at Andra Shiut, whose name meant in the past, fear and pain, and today means history and memory for the Hungarians and for every decent European. Thank you, therefore, Dr. Smith and Dr. Bacioni for inviting me. And today, it is a double privilege to be here in these days of November, when in 1956, the citizens of Budapest and the rest of Hungary were suffering the repression against the patriots who rose up in October. Their remembrance and the commitment to their memory are a heavy burden on the shoulders of us all, Europeans. I'm coming from a country that seems to be very far away, but which shares some common and terrible experiences with Hungary. Spain also knew the terror of Soviet advisors and services. There were five intelligence services working in Spain during the Spanish Civil War for the benefit of the communists and the Soviets. And my country, Spain, became a safe heaven and a home for many Hungarians who fled the country after World War II and also after the Hungarian Revolution of 1956. In fact, Spain and Hungary had already shared a common destiny under the Habsburgs during the 16th century and the 17th century. And although being far away, they were not completely unknown. Not far from here, at the Buddha walls, 300 Spanish assaulted the Ottoman citadel. And as probably you know, there is a plague honoring them. I'm going to, I'm going to start by showing a picture of Spain. This was Spain by, by 1956. General Franco was in power since 1939. There was a period where Spain was divided during the Spanish Civil War, and Franco was in control of approximately half of the Spain, and the rest of the territory was under the Republican control, under the control of the Republic, which was at the same time heavily influenced, increasingly influenced by the Soviet Union. General Frank, as I was saying, was in power since 1939 after defeating the Republican army and their Soviet allies. In fact, Spain was the first country in Western Europe where Soviet influence was definitely whipped away. Since 1939, no communist activity but the other ground would exist. The communist and socialist parties will be declared illegal and their leaders and members would be sent to prison and in some cases executed. And let me be clear with this. Franco was not a Democrat. He was not a liberal. He was not a libertarian. And after the Spanish Civil War, terrible, measure, terrible measures were taken against communists, socialists, anarchists after the Spanish Civil War, which was a fight between brothers that should never happen again. In the Spanish Civil War, there were approximately 300 European communists fighting in the so-called Rakoshi Battalion, 
named after Matthias Rakosi, the Hungarian politician. The commander of this battalion was perhaps, surprisingly enough, Lazaro Reich. Some prominent members of the security apparatus in the Hungarian People's Republic had fought in Spain. For instance, Erno Guerra, who was a terrible name in Spain. He was working for the Comintern, for the International Communist, and he was deeply involved in the repression against the nationalists in the Republican, in the Republican side. He was a Comintern agent in Barcelona, as I mentioned. From this point of view, General Franco was therefore well aware of the communist influence and the communist activity in Central and Eastern Europe. Franco knew how the communists and the Soviets worked in the societies. But there were also other Hungarians that made its way to Spain before the Spanish Civil War, after Bela Kun's revolution. Some of them even got influential positions in society. They became teachers, they became writers, and of course, musicians. In some minutes, we'll be talking about Andor Reves, who in Spain was Andres Reves, who became one of the most influential international journalists in Spain in the 40s and the 50s. By 1956, Spain had a population of almost 30 million people and was coming out a period of international isolation. The Cold War gave Franco the opportunity of portraying himself as the one who was right regarding communism. After a period of isolation, Franco was seen as the one who understood the communist threat in Europe and worldwide. After some hard years of solitude, only the Holy See and few Latin American or Spanish American countries like Argentine kept diplomatic relations. However, between 1949 and 1969, there was a non-official but effective royal diplomatic legation in Spain. And I think it's interesting and inspiring to think that even in the moments of the deepest and the worst solitude of Spain in the international arena, there was a line connecting Spain and the Hungarian non-communist diaspora. The Cold War turned the tide. There were three re relevant moments. First, the International Eucharistical Congress in 1952. Later, the Madrid agreements with the United States, where Spain allowed that the United States would place military bases on Spanish territory. And finally, the moment when Spain joined the United Nations in 1955. So by that year, 1956, Spain was living a sweet moment, or maybe I should say bittersweet, because my country was not an accepted member in the European communities or in NATO. It seems the United States still had some reservations about Franco's regime. It was good enough to fight against communism, but not ready to become a partner with the Western European allies. So it's high time to say a couple of words about General Franco, an officer in the Spanish army, a commander in the African war, the commander of the rebel or the nationalist army in the Spanish Civil War, a most decorated general, Franco considered always himself, first and foremost, a soldier. His worldview was deeply rooted in a Spanish Catholic conservatism. God, homeland, family, work, authority, and above all, anti-communism. Not so different, therefore, from Admiral Miklos Horthy, the regent of the Kingdom of Hungary. As mentioned, Franco knew quite well how the commitment had raised troops all over Europe to support the communist-influenced Spanish Republic in 1936. Among them, one could find those Hungarians, militiamen of the Rakoshi Battalion. 
However, the Kingdom of Hungary had recognized in 1938 Franco's government. Even some steps had already been taken by Hungarian authorities in 1937 to get some kind of, or to give some kind of recognition to Franco's, to Franco's government. Until the fall of Hungary to the communists in 1945, there will be a Hungarian embassy in Madrid, not far from here, and the Spanish embassy in Budapest. However, even when Spain broke up its diplomatic relations with the Hungarian People's Republic, the royal legation of Hungary was kept open and active in Spain. Franco knew very well, as well, what was happening in Hungary by the end of World War II. These are two documents that perhaps you've never seen before. These are two dispatches from Franco's personal archive, an archive that is kept by the foundation, Francisco Franco in Madrid, whose archives are opened and welcoming researchers. And these dispatches were sent from the Spanish embassy to Budapest, very close, very close to here. They were sent by the famous Spanish diplomat, Sanfbrit, righteous among nations, a savior of thousands of Jews in this city of Budapest, Sephardic and non-Sephardic as well, during the Holocaust. The first dispatch says, the one in your left says, anti-Jewish terror has exacerbated. Deportation to Germany of all the Jews remaining in Hungary has been decided. Able men will be transported walking. The women and the elder by train, great fear for their lives. The second dispatch, the one on your right, says, yesterday, the suburbs of Budapest were bombed by Russian planes. Some bombs fell in the downtown. This morning, I have been able to get the liberation of 71 youths who were in a concentration camp near to Budapest. Most of them hadn't eaten in three days. These papers, among others regarding Hungary, were in Franco's, as I mentioned, personal archive, which means that Franco most probably read them personally. In fact, in the archive, some of these documents have even some notes written by Franco himself. There is another important person in our story, Otto von Habsburg. I don't need to introduce this gentleman to the Hungarian audience. You all know that his heart is buried nowhere else but in Panonhalma Abbey, in the middle of the fields of lavender of Transdanubia, Western Hungary. This gentleman was active in Spain in the 50s and in the 60s, whose efforts, his efforts to provide Western governments, including the Spanish government, information about the political situation in Central and Eastern Europe had been reckoned many times in Spain. Franco, thanks to Otto von Habsburg and also to other people, as I will mention in a minute, Franco had rather accurate and updated information about what was going on in the so-called people's democracies. And Franco always made this difference. On the one hand, the nations, the peoples, and on the other hand, the communists and the Soviet advisors. So never did Franco believe that the governments were representing the opinion or the ideals or the ideology of the peoples. In fact, there was an expression which was the oppressed peoples. Los pueblos oprimidos. Thanks to Otto von Habsburg's influence, Spain took several steps towards Hungarian exiles and emigres in Spain. For instance, providing residence permits to non-communist Hungarians, launching scholarship programs and hosting them in Spanish universities and research institutions, and broadcasting programs in Hungarian in the Spanish national radio. There were already some Hungarian intellectuals giving an understanding or an insight of what was happening in Hungary in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. For instance, this gentleman, the one you have looking at the camera, he was Ando Reves, Andres Reves. He came to Spain before the Spanish Civil War 
and was most probably cooperating underground with Franco's army from Madrid. After the war, he became a most influential journalist in the conservative monarchist newspaper ABC. ABC. He was also reporting on the Soviet influence in the satellite countries and the terrible conditions imposed on the communist oppressed peoples of Europe. But probably of all the people we might mention to understand the Spanish position regarding the revolution, the position of the royal legation in Madrid is the most important one and the person in charge of this legation. This was the key instrument to make the Spanish or to, to influence the Spanish policy regarding Hungary in 1956. This plague is remembering the royal legation of Hungary in Spain, a non-official, but at the same time very effective office with a status similar to the diplomatic status, although there were not official relationships with, with Hungary. And the man in charge was this gentleman, sorry, not this gentleman, but this gentleman, Count Marosche, Ferenc Marosche. He was a man trusted by Otto von Habsburg. He became the self-appointed representative of the Hungarian non-communist diaspora in Spain, although he was in touch with the non-communist diasporas in other countries, for instance, in the Americas. Intelligent, extremely cultivated, charming sometimes. When I read Miklos Banfi, Trilogy of Transylvania, I imagine the nobleman described by Miklos Banfi, like Maroshi, sophisticated, intelligent, educated, in, in the best sense of the word, a truly European. So these features made Francisco de Marossi, who was the name he got in Spanish, Ferenc Marossi, a well-deserved influence among Francoist authorities, especially among certain decision makers. This is one of the reasons why, when the students in the university asked to me, why should we become diplomats? This is one of the reasons. You can change many things from the position for good, as Ferenc Marosi did. He managed to help dozens, if not hundreds, of Hungarians try to, who tried to escape communism. For instance, and I'm coming back for a second, Kubala. Laszlo Kubala. Of course, in Spanish, we, at that time, not anymore, but at that time, people tended to, to translate the name, so he was Ladislao. Ladislao Kubala, the renowned Barcelona football player who was given permission to live in Spain in 1951, and there he's buried. So let's move to Maroche and his influence in the 50s, and specifically in 1956. Maroche was the first one to move to, to the Spanish authorities to get some relief when Soviet troops invaded Hungary. His influence in Madrid and the support he had from Otto von Habsburg, whose opinion was highly evaluated by Franco, in fact, Otto von Habsburg's reports were considered secret, were considered classified, only for some people in the highest level of the Spanish authorities. This report, as I was saying, gave Maroshi access to the Spanish highest positions, for instance, Alberto Martin Artajo, who was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and his delegate in the United Nations, Jose Felix de Lequerica. Otto von Habsburg, as I was saying, was a highly evaluated person, and so did Ferenc, Ferenc Maroche. Here you have another picture of Count Maroche and a small part of the Hungarian legation to Madrid in the 50s. In fact, the first country to act diplomatically in support of Hungary was my country, was Spain. Maroshi's first request for help was presented to the Spanish government on October the 26th on behalf of Archduke Otto von Habsburg. He asked Franco to address the Security Council 
of the United Nations protesting Moscow's aggression. Remember that Spain was a recently incorporated or recently new member of the United Nations after a long period of isolation. It was a difficult decision to, to put some pressure on the Western governments to take steps to help Hungary. However, he asked Franco to address the Security Council protesting, as I mentioned, Moscow's aggression. And uh, unfortunately, despite the efforts by Jose Félix de Lecarica, the Spanish delegate to the United Nations, the protest didn't make its way and, uh, and a resolution by the Security Council was not, was not obtained. In fact, the Soviet Union had a veto power. But that was not the reason. The reason was that the United States, the American government, was very cautious. And perhaps it's not exaggerated to say a bit scared of the consequences of the developments in Hungary. But not only did Spain act diplomatically, but also domestically in the Spanish policy making. Franco summoned a council of ministers to explore different ways of helping the revolutionaries. Some of the meetings at different levels followed, and finally, finally it was clear that there was a political will, a political decision to help Hungary in October. Since the very first days of the revolution, humanitarian relief was sent through the Austrian border. Rice, clothes, flour, some medicines. There were also masses and public pray prayings for the Hungarians in mayor Spanish churches. Let me stop here for a second because we shouldn't underestimate this part. Spain had many levels of the international policy. Many decisions were taken regarding different countries. But this case of Hungary was different because the Spanish public opinion, the Spanish people, I would say the Spanish hearts were with the Hungarians. There were masses, there were demonstrations in the streets. This very seldom happened. Franco's regime was not very prone to mobilize people for any cause except the national celebrations or commemorations. But the case of Hungary was the case of a people that was seen from Spain as a Christian people oppressed by the communist, by a communist regime that was at the same time controlled by the Soviet Union. So masses were celebrated, public prayings were held in the Spanish churches, the Spanish media were covering the revolution as a heroic revolt for the homeland against the Soviet Union, which means the communist rule. And the fact that there were communists, patriots among the revolutionaries, and that they were quite diverse themselves, was not framed in the Spanish newspapers. For the Spanish public opinion, it was patriots against communists, not so much against communist patriots and non-communist patriots together against the, the Soviet influence. And to understand what happened later, the next steps, we need to pay attention to this map. Europe in the Cold War was conditioned, especially Western Europe, of course, by the presence of the American military bases. Following action, or taking action regarding the, the Hungarian Revolution and following the suggestion, the request, coming from the Hungarians in exile, the Spanish government took the decision of considering military actions. And specifically, two kind of military actions were proposed in the days of the November Soviet invasion. First, there was a proposal to organize a volunteer corps to go to fight in Hungary. And perhaps you would be surprised to know that the Spanish government was ready to send volunteers to join the Hungarian revolutionaries. And not just Hungarians in the diaspora, 
but also Spanish volunteers. Remember, the Spanish Civil War had happened not so many years ago, and there was this notion that fighting communism was being in the right side of history, if I may take the, the fixed expression. So there were volunteers, Spanish volunteers, I mean. For instance, there was, there was a group of students from the University of Valladolid in Castile who volunteered, including two sons of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Alberto Martin Artajo, and they volunteered to join the combats. The war minister, Agustin Muñoz Grandes, a decorated general for, from the Spanish division of volunteers, the ones who had fought in the Soviet Union in Russia, alongside the Germans and other, and other volunteers and soldiers from all countries, against the Soviet Union. Agustin Muñoz Grandes, this decorated general, also volunteered to be the commander of this corps. On November the 5th, the Spanish ambassador in London informed his ministry that 2,000 Hungarians living in Great Britain and willing to fight for Hungary in Hungary were demanding that Spain gave them access to the border. Spanish help to go to the border with Hungary. And Spanish academic Luis Suarez even has, has stated, and he had very good access to, to Spanish sources of that time, that Franco, remember that Franco was a soldier. He was mostly a soldier. That Franco even thought of providing Hungarian volunteers with money, weapons, and American material, and parachute them on some Hungarian-controlled area in Western Hungary. There was also an official offer of anti-tank weapons and 10,000 rifles. In November the 4th, the Spanish Minister of Foreign Affairs confirmed the free delivery of ammunition and weapons, rifles and grenades, to the Hungarian revolutionaries, to the Hungarian patriots. But there was a problem here, and that's why we need to see the map. This military aid couldn't be transported from Spain directly to Hungary. An American air base was needed, the American air base in Munich. This need was essential because the weapons would be, would be borne from Spain to Germany and from Germany to the border with Hungary by road. This military aid, therefore, was needed to be sent through the American air base in Munich, and from there, by road, to the border. The plan was to deliver them to the Hungarians somewhere near San Batel. After all the activity promoting the uprising on Radio Free Europe, for instance, in Radio Free Europe, the names of the secret agents of the AVH were broadcasted for the people to know, it made just sense to the Spanish authorities that the United States will support the Spanish efforts to help the Hungarians. At the end of the day, Radio for Europe and the West, let's say, had encouraged the Hungarians to fight against the communist authorities. So it was with great dismay that Franco learned from Count Maroche that the White House vetoed any intervention including the use of the American bases in Germany to help the Hungarian Revolution. And they were somehow puzzled. The information came through the diplomat Georgi Bokoc Beseny in, in the United States, who learned it from Bela Bokshoi, the General Secretary of the Hungarian League of America. Once in Madrid, they learned that the United States were vetoing the help to the Hungarians with a, great, with a great, I would say, disappointment. The whole operation was canceled by this decision of the United States to stay away. Later, developments are very well known. 
after the 4th of November, 4th, 5th of November, depending on the region of Hungary, the Soviet army controlled the country. And the only last way of helping the Hungarians was to open the Spanish borders for the ones who made its way to Spain. This was the case, for instance, of Ferenc Puskas, whose picture we can see here. And uh, thus, ladies and gentlemen, the Hungarian revolutionaries were abandoned. There are many explanations for this, for this decision. The fear of another world war, the recognition of a spheres of influence in Europe by the United States, the crisis of the Suez Canal, which could be a major conflict, the risk of giving Spain the position of the only country who effectively delivered relief to the Hungarian patriots. But however, when I think of, of this place, the Terror Haza, and, and the fight in Budapest, when I remember the lads of Pest, that very few days after the the decision of not getting involved in Hungary by the United States, the lads of Pest, and the deportations during the months following the revolution, I cannot help to feel a, a deep sorrow. I think that the West uh, didn't deliver enough. Those revolutionaries who stood for the freedom of Hungary we could, we could quote or misquote Peter Fischandor, Sabal Chak Saralem, liberty and, and love, for the love of liberty they fought. Those revolutionaries gave a lesson of courage and dignity to the world. And I like to think that during those days of hope and tragedy, Spain stood beside Hungary. Thank you very much. Köszönöm szépen.